It's uh, inspiring being here and also kind of um, humbling. Um, uh, I wanted to uh, tell you that I come from a very um, specific, narrow background of specialty retailing. And I've been there for like 30 years, so when it comes to technology or consumer branding, uh, not so much. Um, that you might think about, because I come from retail, I would be a perfect fit for this conference because retail is all about operations and executions, like a restaurant. If you can't, you know, you manage a lot of products and, and information and transactions every day. And if you don't do it, you're out, you're out of business. But the truth is, I've never really been a skilled operator myself. I'm one of these impatient people and um, a little problems with authority. Um, um, I can do the vision thing okay, but, um, um, but I've been responsible for two pretty cool companies. And I've got there by surrounding myself with talent. So that's one of the uh, themes that I wanted to um, drill down on today. The other fact is that um, um, I probably have more experience with failure than success. Um, um, the, in retail, it's largely about you launch 10 products and you watch nine of them flop and, and you become pretty uh, humble uh, that way. So, um, and I'll show you some of my best work in that area today. Um, in thinking about this talk, I, I opened this drawer at home and it had these rhodia pads that reminded me of, of um, they go back to the beginning time of, of Design Within Reach, which is in 1999. I took a, a full year off, um, quit my job, 7 by 24, um, really to learn about the design industry and really to test my hypothesis that we should make um, design more accessible. So I traveled the world and, and interviewed everybody uh, that knew more than me to try to kind of figure out what was wrong with this. And the people in here at Palo Antonelli, Aisha Bursell, or Beth, you're out there somewhere, and your conversations are located somewhere in those, in those pads. But um, after, I, after I did this, um, I felt confident that I um, couldn't find any big holes in, in, in my idea, and I raised some money and, and started a business that grew quite quickly and, and quite successfully. And there were three other companies that were started at that time that were funded in the 20 million, 50 million, 100 million dollars. That was furniture.com, goodhome.com, and something else. And um, the dot-com bubble burst, and they evaporated, and we were still standing. Um, and I think the reason for that was, was not that I was much smarter, but I had really spent the time researching this problem, but also I'd really asked a lot of questions. And I had built a lot of allies and a lot of these friends that kind of stuck with us over the uh, long term. And I think in, in uh, why is this relevant? I think in the creative communities, we, we like to show people that we're more clever sometimes than more curious. But I found that being curious and ask questions really endears um, um, smart people to you. So it took a lot of time and asked a lot of questions in, in, in the formation of, of Design Within Reach. And um, uh, you know, we, we get a lot of uh, credit for our, our success and all that. And I put the slide up. I don't want to leave the slide on the, uh, too long because you'll realize that there was so much low-hanging fruit um, in the design world at that time that I was just being a lot more logical than, than, than creative. I mean, uh, you know, first online newsletter and carrying an inventory and shipping immediately. I mean, we're the first company to stock an Aeron chair, and it was the best-selling chair in, in, in history, uh, and providing universal assets. Anyway, um, uh, we were essentially the first design company to harness the internet. But, but relevant to this conference, I think, we really focused on, on speed and, and not style. And um, so I'd sort of say we're really the first design retailer to really prioritize kind of operations. My first hire was um, um, a guy who had 20 years experience in, in the industry. So we could kind of hit the ground running. We built our, a website and titled ourselves. My designer friend said, it, you know, it looks more like a hardware store than a designer website. And said, that's the point. It works really quickly. But um, 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 let's, let's move on. That, that, um, something that a less obvious lesson that I learned in, in DWR was the, the value of being a little bit crazy when you start a business. And this came home to me um, um, and when you're a startup, getting people to work with you um, is, is tricky. And, and, and DWR, this meant getting the Italians to work with us because we needed their products. Uh, DWR was largely started with the Herman Miller collection and about, Italian, and about 10 Italian vendors. And in a meeting with a, real, a super critical meeting with an important vendor, I, I tried my flattery and my pentagram boards, and that didn't go anywhere. And finally, I just admitted, OK, I'm a little crazy. And 
they said, well, we're a little crazy too. And, and they, um, um, they supported me and, and then things could, were kind of a roll from there. But, but that stuck with me, that idea of being out there a little bit and pushing, pushing the boundaries. And, and because we had very successful um, operations and we were highly profitable initially, it allowed us to have a lot more fun with the business. And I did a lot of things that, that it may seem common now that they were heretical to retailers back at that time, like filling our studios with uh, portraits and biographies of designers and we were flying in Spanish designers and, and, and having conferences and I was flying around the world and writing a letter every week, a newsletter every week about everything but furniture design. We launched some um, used vintage Vespas from Italy, really dumb because they're liability issues and you can't really send them and, and all that stuff. But, but what, what um, um, I learned from that was that you know, if you don't have much money, you can build a brand on the cheap by doing this kind of stuff. But more than that, because we were breaking a lot of rules, um, we really attracted extraordinarily talented people. DWR became a magnet for, for really the tremendous people. So on the basis of having great operations and really terrific staff, that's what made the business um, uh, successful. And I think it's what makes a business successful today. Um, if you'll indulge me a little. I took, this, I took this photograph several years ago in a remote part of Uruguay, and I've been waiting for an opportunity to use it. I was in this remote area. Here's a guy reading a book on, on branding in his leisure time. He looks like he's lecturing his, his grandkids that, <laughs> that are all decked out in J. Crew or something. But this is just an actual shot, walking along the pool. And I think if we went down there today and that same guy was there, I think that book would be on... on um, design thinking, you know? I think that uh, uh, I'm happy that design has entered the business vocabularies and common parlance, but I have this sense that it's, it's getting marginalized a little bit. And it's just my way of thinking that, or asking, so, you know, I really believe that designers are the most uh, like, important species on the planet and that have capabilities of really changing the world. And I love to see it when it's applied to solving some really new problems, not just the promotion of uh, selling the same old kind of products, stuff like that. So I get really excited when I see a company like Airbnb that's taking on the whole hospitality industry and going about things differently. So I took um, a DWR, I went public, and then things got really crazy and I had to get out of there. Uh, and I spent a few years, um, um, then came up with this concept called public bikes. And it was largely similar, kind of like a bikes within reach, you know, web platform, um, uh, make well-designed stuff accessible to a broad group of people. It initially resulted in the biggest failure of my career, like times 10. So I wanted to um, share that pain with you in some detail. Okay, so, <laughs> so like, like DWR, there were a whole lot of firsts. Um, and and uh, first e-commerce, really, uh, in, in, the, in the industry, um, we really focused on women who are really underserved in this market prior to our social media and, and all that stuff. But uh, first, I'll get on, on a whole bunch of this stuff. And I had been um, spent a lot of time in Europe and watching the enlightened kind of urbanization movement. Europe's a little bit ahead of the U.S. Um, uh, but bike share programs in Paris, you got stuff in Amsterdam, you know, Copenhagen, all that, and bike share things happening in the U.S. But I saw this whole movement towards urbanization and more intelligence and mobility. You know, in New York, Bloomberg's here, and Times Square's made a pedestrian zone, and uh, Daily in New York with Millennium Park, phenomenal stuff going on in San Francisco, even in Los Angeles, converting it to um, a bike area. So I thought, this is great. All these trends are working in this right direction. This all made sense. This was a typical bike store, and this is actually a good one. This is kind of what they, what they look like. Um, this is the fanciest booth in the fanciest trade show. Um, um, and this would give you an idea of how you might feel as a woman in the industry. But it looks, it looks <laughs> kind of like a, um, a, a, a tech conference, but I figured this is the least, the least visual industry I'd ever been in. There's a lot of low-hanging fruit. This is going to be a slam dunk. It was just basically to shift the psychology from the American notion of cycling to a softer kind of European thing. So, so this is just kind of the image of the company and, 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 and how we started. Uh, and use this on the cover of the catalog and, and, and the website. And um, partners were like coming to us, like Gap created a pop-up store for us and bought our products at retail and put it in the best location in San Francisco. Um, Treetorn gave us free space in their um, uh, space in, in, in Soho in, in New York. 
This is the media coverage that we had at the time of our launch. This is 99. We don't have an agency, no PR. This, our story was just that good that everybody was covering us. So uh, we, we launched the business, and it's a blank slide because it was a complete disaster. Like I can, I can spot a dog when I see it. I'm pretty good at reading metrics, and this one was, was um, really tricky. And um, I kind of let a week go by to see what happened, let the dust settle, and it stayed that way, and you've got investors and staff all asking you what's going on, and I had really no idea. I really, I really didn't. All I knew, um, I um, uh, thought maybe the name is really wrong, public, you know, or maybe the shopping cart doesn't work. I know shopping carts work, and there's just not much stuff going through it, but um, <laughs> I was like in a, a fetal position, really, at home on the couch, like for... <laughs> for um, uh, about a week with that, you know, that feeling of loss in your stomach or failure and you, and you don't know. So finally I, I, I got together, you know, got together with, with the staff, our small crew, um, and I summoned my favorite quote that I use all the time, you know, Mark Twain, when in doubt, tell the truth. And I said, here's the truth. I have no idea why it's not working. You know, all I know is that I've never been so wrong in all my life. And, and, um, but I said, but I think it's probably a lot of things because it's such a, um, an epic collapse. And so we um, changed, the, and, you know, and we're there sitting with a couple containers of bicycles that nobody wants, and, and I could see that we're going to be out of dough by the end of the year. Um, so we said, so okay, our only, our only hope, okay, let's bring in some cheaper bikes and try to get them in, in for the holidays, and let's see what happens. And, uh, and we did that, and it worked. Uh, and this wasn't like the turnaround event, but it gave us light at the end of the tunnel, or just some vision that this, this, this business could actually be sustainable. Um, but I met with, but you know, carrying the weight of a failure when it's, you know, investors and, and your money and your idea for nine months, it's, it's a burden. And I don't, I don't take rejection that well anyway. Um, but um, um, I really sat with a group and I kind of said, hey, you guys, my little management team, hey, failure is really an option. And, and um, uh, what I know is I don't have any silver bullets. This is way over my pay grade. And uh, you guys are terrific. You've done a great job. And if you want to make this work, um, let's go. I love you guys, love our mission, want to make this happen, but it's going to be up to you. And they said, let's do it. And, and so I um, uh, uh, did the normal kinds of things of, of asking them to step up in management, gave them a lot more stock of the company. And now it's four years later, and we had our, um, our first profitable year. And um, I was able to raise a couple million bucks. And um, um, there's a store we just opened up in, in Seattle. And, um, will be um, um, perhaps opening up a store near, near you soon. Um, the, the, um, the, the, I want to uh, talk about, and take this, take this the, uh, the right way, um, um, a little bit of a challenge to the, the premise of the 99U conference is that I believe that um, serendipity and chance um, play um, a lot in our roles of stuff. And, 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 and I bring this up kind of as a footnote to the failure thing, thinking that I've learned to be kind of humble, and, and, and I don't really like seeing too much arrogance, and I think that being humble also attracts people to, to work with you. So I'm gonna, I've had my share of good luck, and I'm gonna tell you just a, a few stories. Um, this is a current website from DWR. It wasn't, wasn't the one that I'm gonna be referring to, but in our first year of DWR, we were um, um, way ahead of plan and completely burned out, and I gave all of the staff Thanksgiving off of four full days. You don't do that in, in retail. And this is like 99. We just put a little sign up on the web that sort of said, um, uh, no one's here, but if you place an order, you get 10% off. And, and everybody went home and said, we'll, we'll talk to them. And this was back when you usually had some human interaction to manage transactions. Everything wasn't quite automated. And um, uh, during that Thanksgiving period, we had budgeted, I think, to do 50,000, and I think we did 500,000. But we did 10 times what we thought we would do. Now, this is 15 years later, and everybody knows how to promote and do sales on the web, but this was early on. But it was mind-blowing what we did. And that, that sale event worked into a semi-annual event that actually allowed our company to be profitable a full year before we had anticipated. And why is that relevant? Well. Uh, after that period, both with the dot-com um, burst and also with 9-11, it was a really grim period in, in, in the economy and for retail in, in particular. And, and had we um, uh, not figured out, had we not been profitable at that time, uh, we may have gone under. Uh, but instead, we were fortunate and we could um, you know, pick up some cheap leases in New York and, and take the company forward. But it was really, really, really by chance. 
Um, this is Dan. Dan is my partner at, at Public Bikes. He's the 99U. He's the reason that the business actually works. He's the reason I can talk here and, and write books. Um, I didn't find Dan through LinkedIn. I was having a bike ride down Valencia Street in San Francisco before the company. There was a kind of a dapper guy on a cool bike with some accessories. And I said, hey, could I talk to you? Just kind of learn about some of the stuff on your bike. And he came down. And we became good friends. And he came to work at, at Public. Um, uh, and he's been there ever since and, and been through a lot of these difficult times, but he managed this. He's like the COO, had no background in retail from public policy and Harvard and activists, but manages the whole thing. But as I say, uh, a casual bike ride and some just ended up being the person that's like actually running the business, so that's pretty poetic. Um, the, the last one here is, is a design within reach. The, the actual identity of design within reach came about, it was a total, a total fluke. I had this idea that I wanted the company to be named Octopus. Just I wanted some sort of irreverent kind of organic thing that was anti-Helvetica and anti mees all the stuff that, that I love. But I just thought it, we needed to take some of the edge off of, off of it. So um, um, I love the logo of DWR. Even when I see it now on homeless people and stuff like that, it, it's great. This was uh, Kit Heinrichs at, at Pentagram who, who did this, but, but I love it. But, but anyway, so we're, we're there at the early stage of the business trying to make this octopus thing work, and the guys are tolerating me, you know, try to make an octopus work. And it was, a, it was a pretty dumb idea. This wasn't it, but this was kind of the thing. And if you imagine that working with modern design, not so much. But Alex, a copywriter guy, um, and, and part of it, we, we came up against this deadline. Okay, we had to get paperwork done in order to take money to form the business, get a website and all that stuff. And he had actually come up with a tagline for this octopus called Design Within Reach, thinking of the tentacles. And so push came to shove, and we just kind of said, hey, let's start. It's going to be a stacking logo. Kid isn't going to like it, but let's make it work. And that's what we did. Um, so uh, bearing that in mind and my um, uh, uh, preference for, for a little bit of being, being a little crazy and also having friends uh, help me out with stuff, I, I, I thought I'd just take this 99U logo, which I love. I think, I think it's terrific. And I just asked some friends to play around with it and, and inject some of this serendipity and a little bit of, of humor to it. Okay, so these are quick sketches. Don't take them seriously at all. This one is from uh, my friend John, John Bielenberg. You may know John, and it's kind of a silly bit of a... It looks a little like my, my octopus, but I think it's human, humanizing this thing a little bit. Uh, Jennifer Morla, you may know her. She um, uh, uh, takes a whole different approach. And I didn't ask any of these people what, how to interpret these things. You're all designers, so you can probably do that. But I think the color or jumping over fences or the focus on you being you uh, was really good. Um, and, and this is, this is um, uh, Michael, Michael Vanderbile. Um, um, and and um, I, I love this logo. I think, I think this is terrific. But I think the, the interpretation here could go number one or another. Don't be, a, don't be a sheep, or, or this and that, or, or in fact that um, um, any of us can get um, sheared at, at any time. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much.